Hello, I'm Dr. Gay Carlson, president of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry with number 23 of my Screenside Chats for our ACAP members. Screenside Chats, as you know, are meant to share timely clinical practice and other information from experts on key topics during COVID-19, continuing to plague us, though I hope getting somewhat better. Reminiscent of President Roosevelt's fireside chats during the Great Depression and World War II, I'm hoping they'll be informative and comfortable and fill a niche not addressed by materials otherwise available. Today, we'll continue the theme of rising above racism. Over the past year, I'm proud to say, ACAP has heightened its support and attention to issues concerning health equity and racism. We recognize that to be fully able to promote and advance health equity ideals and standards, we need a workforce made up of culturally competent practitioners, researchers, and training directors. And that's why today's Screenside Chats is so important. I'm therefore pleased to introduce Dr. Alyssa P. Bell. Dr. Bell is a board certified child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. She's practiced medicine for 31 years in Illinois, Michigan, and Indiana. A distinguished alumna of Southern Illinois Medical School, Dr. Bell is known as a community psychiatrist. She's the author of a recently published book, Are You Culturally Competent? Clinicians discuss the relevance of cultural competency in their practices. As you know, ACAP is not in the business of promoting books, but this one has got some information that we're gonna to discuss today. So we're gonna start off with a very simple question, Dr. Bell. Tell us what is cultural competency? Uh, but first, I want to say I want to like to say good morning and thank you for having me here today to discuss this very important topic. Cultural competency is a set of congruent behaviors, attitudes, and policies that come together in a system, agency, or among professionals, and and, and enable that system, that agency, or those professionals to work effectively cross in cross cultural situations. So, why do you think it's important? I mean, this is almost a no-brainer, but, but spell it out. Why is it important for healthcare professionals to practice cultural competency? And why particularly is it important during COVID-19? The National Center of Cultural Competency at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., the director, Tawari uh, Good, who I had the pleasure of meeting four years ago when I interviewed her for my book, she states that this cultural competency training helps respond to the current and the projected demographic changes in the United States. So in 24 years, Dr. Carlson, the United States of America would be over 50% diverse. That's in 2044. And on her website, ncc.georgetown.edu, they list five different specific reasons why cultural competency training is important. The first one is to eliminate the healthcare disparity gap of people of direct of uh, diverse ethnic or racial cultural backgrounds. And the second one being to improve the quality of service and to improve healthcare outcomes. So when you improve these outcomes, you, you, you uh, increase the satisfaction that, for the care of the patients. Uh, they're more adherent to treatment. Uh, the third one would be to meet legislative, regulatory and accreditation mandates to gain a competitive edge in the marketplace and to decrease the likelihood of liability and malpractice claims. And of course, during COVID, better health outcomes, and we can save more lives. So how does an individual professional know if they're culturally competent? How's it measured? How, how, will, how will I know that I will be a better, a more astute clinician um, as my consciousness is raised? Uh, well, no one is 100% culturally competent. Culture is not, is, is not stagnant. It's forever changing. When you go all the way back before BCE era, culture, you'll see that culture, how culture influenced how, how we practice medicine. So uh, culture, cultural competency is on a continuum. And one of the experts in the cultural competency field, Terry uh, L. Gross, Cross, discussed the six different stages where culture, uh, where, where a person can identify where they are along the cultural competency spectrum. The first one being cultural destructiveness, where a person says, my culture is the best, we're the only culture that exists. Uh, they see themselves as superior. Now we're going from the least culturally competent stage to the most 
competent state. Uh, so this person would see this, this group would see themselves as superior, they're better, uh, and when in, the, in other cultures would feel inferior. The second one would be cultural incapacity, incapacity, which means that that culture says, well, I'm only going to serve my group. I'm only going to serve my culture. Uh, and so it would make other cultures feel unwelcome and unappreciated. The third one would be cultural blindness, where a person says all cultures are the same. You know, we, we'll, you know everybody's the same. Um, and, and that's to say that, well, if all the cultures are the same, if the dominant culture, if what's good for the dominant culture, is it good for all the other cultures? This is not true. And the fourth one would be the pre-competency stage, where a person would, that, that person or that group would be aware of their culturally destructive attitudes, behaviors, uh, and beliefs, but they want to become more culturally competent. The fifth stage is cultural competency, where the person has an acceptance of the diversity, of the differences of the different cultures, and they promote um, a showing of, uh, of sharing of environment that's inclusive to all people. Okay, and then the very last one would be cultural proficiency, where that person or that group would have a great respect for diverse cultures, uh, identifying cultures uh, as the underpinning for effective, productive, and inclusive relationships with other people or groups, uh, um, organizational structures and systems. Now, so years ago, Dr. Carlson, when I started uh, teaching this in the university settings, I generally would give a, a small, a very quick cultural IQ exam. And on the back of the exam, a person could, could score their own uh, cultural IQ. And I met, at times I met resistance. So I had to talk to that group of individuals uh, to let them know that your culture is important. I'm not trying to change who you are or anything about your culture, but there are other cultures that do exist. So sometimes there's a learning, uh, learning resistance. And it has to be an environment where uh, that group or that, it, that group of organizations is accepting uh, uh, the need for some cultural competency training. So, so <clears throat> what you're saying, at least as I understand it, is cultural competence isn't knowing the ins and outs of all the myriad of different cultures there are in the world. It's kind of starting with a platform of respect that basically says, um, you know, you, you have a you have something unique. I, w I want to know what it is. It might have something to do with what's going on. I mean, I'm a child psychiatrist. It might have something to do with what's going on with you and your kids. It might have nothing to do with it. But, you know, I, I, need, to know, <clears throat> I need to know that about you. But I don't necessarily have to know what your c culture is. So is, is that what you're trying yeah, to so say? Yeah, so you're not going to know everything about everyone's culture. As long as you're sitting at the table and, and you, uh, you let the patient be salient and identify who they are. And don't be judgmental at the time that they discuss who they are, because there's different identities and some of these identities cross sect. A good example is I'm an African-American woman, I'm heterosexual, or it could be an, it could be an African-American woman who's, who's biracial, who's, who's, who's a Mexican uh, African-American and be a lesbian. So there's intersectionalities. You have to allow the patient, be patient to identify who they are. And this will solidify and it would improve the, the trust in the relationship. And they would be more forthcoming uh, about who they are. Just be non-judgmental and be supportive. So if I were to say to you, we, we were talking about this before, before the show, and I commented on the uh, pretty uh, shirt you're wearing. It, I can't tell exactly what, but it's a lovely color. And it looks like it's got an interesting neck um, embroidery or whatever. So, so, if you were my patient or, you know, I'm going to say patient because as my friend, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate for a second to make a comment about it. Okay. Uh, but as a, as a patient, what, what, how might, would that be something that might be taken as offensive? Who is this woman to judge my clothes or, oh, well, it's nice she noticed or, well, I don't know. She's, you know, just making small talk. H how would that work? And how do you feel when I ask you that? And, 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 you know, let, let's move that on for, for a minute. Tell me about your show. Well, I, you know, if you can just say something really pleasant about, you know, uh, as, a, as your patient, Elisa, that's really pretty. I, I like the embroidery. And, and that's very graceful and welcoming to someone who's of a different culture who wants to share 
something beautiful that they're wearing. That's not crying. Uh, that's opening up a conversation. And then that the person may start talking about, oh, yes, I, I received this as a gift from Ghana, West Africa, when I visited many years ago. Uh, and it was a gift for one of the queens and, and, and uh, one of the, you know, uh, one of the overseers in the village. So mm -hmm. it would open up the conversation. It wouldn't be prying. It would be very appropriate mm -hmm. if saying in a very positive manner. And that's so, honest. I, I think one of the things that I know I can talk, I can speak for myself. I don't know if I can speak for other people. I speak for myself. That um, it's it's important to 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 be your yourself. It's important mm -hmm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. But you don't. But you don't want to put your foot in it, and you don't want to um, offend. You don't want to make a person feel judged like you know some people might say god i didn't expect her to make judgments about my clothes when i came in here <laughs> so so y you understand that's kind mm -hmm. of the uh the scylla and charybdis that that we sometimes feel like we're walking between and um I, i'm not i don't know i certainly don't expect you to answer it for the world but um mm -hmm. i don't know do you have any thoughts about that as long as you're respectful and you're honest in your presentation when you ask the question. And you're being respectful and truly uh, and truly curious. The curiosity uh, bring it to come to the table. There's ways you can ask questions, and that takes experience with practice over a period of time. As, as I stated, co cultural competency is a learning process. It's a lifelong learning process. When I leave the front door and go to the corner to get a paper, that's a cultural exchange. Um, I, so as long as I continue to educate myself, become more knowledgeable about different cultures, whether they're going to the theater, going to a dance, from a performance by another culture or visiting a certain country, but there's ways you can engage and you learn that as you become more knowledgeable about different cultures. You don't have to know everything about a culture, but there's ways to talk. You have to, there's three things. I'm gonna give you three tenets. Uh, that you can use, particularly now during COVID, that can start the conversation with your patients and being more, becoming more culturally competent. The first one is empathy. Now, you're not going to, uh, it's, it's not about how you feel. It's about how you, how you allow your patient to recognize that you care uh, about how they're feeling physically and emotionally. You listen intently. You, you, you say, well, uh, you know, during this COVID situation, do you feel, are you fearful? Do you feel sorry? I don't think that that's not prying, okay? And that's empathy would be the first one. And then second, the second one would be curiosity. This is what we were just discussing. Um, so you, you, allow the, you allow the patient or, you know, the person that you're talking to, to, to open up and to talk about uh, what the issues are. And there's ways you can ask questions. Uh, in an honest way as the doctor would ask the patient without, without prying. And thirdly, uh, the third one, uh, which is, I feel was the most important one, um, um, is respect. Be respectful in your questions. You're not prying. And during COVID, some of my friends and even some of my, not my distant family members have certain preventive measures or use certain medicinals instead of medically based or scientifically proven methods to prevent the COVID. And I don't want to be non-judgmental non -judgmental with them. I'm going to listen to them and I'm going to make, I'm going to get eye contact when I'm speaking with them or by Zoom or, and maintain that contact. I don't want to be non-judgmental. I don't want to be tempted to do that. I'm going to listen intently, listen very closely, but I'm going to speak candidly, softly about their, their condition, their health condition, and encourage the participation uh, in the planning, either going forth to be seen by a doctor and to discuss what their prevention is with their physician. So there's ways that we could uh, engage patients, but it takes practice, practice, and, and, and you know, like I said, no one's 100% culturally competent. This is a lifelong process. So empathy, respect, and, and curiosity. Curiosity. Yes, so, ma'am. That's three okay. tenets for you. Yeah. Okay, good. Open up communication. Um, so tell us about, in, in your book, you had uh, a, a number of different uh, doctors uh, interviewed about different um, 
aspects of patient, you know, from from uh, gender identity to coming from different places, et cetera. G- give us an example of uh, of a case of cultural competency. Well, I'm going to I'm going to make this personal so I can talk firsthand. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was uh, and this is in the book. When I returned from my first year of college, I went to school in Iowa, came back home for the summer in Chicago. Um, I became ill about a month after returning home. I had a fever. I was short of breath. I uh, had problems breathing. I had pain as I had my inspiration. So I went to a freestanding clinic. Uh, it's a clinic for someone who doesn't have insurance. So I was triaged by the nurse and I was escorted into the doctor's office. When I got into the doctor's office, he talked to me with his back turned to me. He never looked at me. He asked me all these questions and it wasn't a lot of questions about, you know, it was more about the medical condition, but it wasn't about what was going on with me. Um, he, didn't, he did not turn around and look at me until he started to examine me. And after he examined me, he said, young lady, you have pneumonia. And I want you to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop partying it up. And I, and I tried to interrupt him. And he just said, here. Do those things. Here's a prescription. <laughs> Take this prescription and come back in, in so many weeks. And I just sat there and I said to myself, this man doesn't know who I am. He's not aware that I'm a dean student. I, you know, I, I wanted to get straight A's to keep my scholarship and it's, it's my university in Iowa. In Iowa. I had to fulfill the, this requirement of continuing education, volunteering at a daycare for children in Iowa mm-hmm. for the last three months prior to coming home. And then once I got home, I volunteered at Northwestern Children Memorial at the microbiology department and gave blood for a young boy who was about to have surgery. So I was immunocompromised. So I felt that he was, he had poor communication. He assumed who I was. He made these assumptions about who I was. I never went back. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that I healed, that I just felt that I was objectified and I was just, uh, because it was, you know, I was a student, I was a pre-med student, you know? Mm-hmm. So if I were to see this gentleman today, <laughs> I would talk to him, you know, in a nice way, but just explain it. But he may not even listen. Yeah. Who knows? I wonder, I wonder if there would have been a way. I mean, I can't imagine a young person having the, I don't know, chutzpah or whatever, what word you'd call it to do it. I, I, but you know what? It, it, it does seem like it might be a, a, an educational experience to be able to say to the doctor, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how many African-American students you know, and, and maybe they are all rebel rousers, but you know, I'm not actually, I'm a Dean student and I just gave a pint of blood and I'm probably debilitated. And um, does that change your recommendations for me? I mean, because it, it, it might be that the guy is busy and he doesn't have any social skills. It has nothing to do with the fact that you're black, brown, or green. Um, and, uh, you know, he needs a little bit of a hit upside the head. Um, I don't know. Is that something that, that you could imagine patients doing? Probably, uh, if, if I would have returned, I may have said something to him like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm an independent, struggling young woman who's, uh, who, who, you know, who's, who's trying to take the route to become a, a physician so I can heal, so I can help, uh, you know, and I was always taught by my grandparents to treat others the way you want to be treated. Uh, you know, I probably talked to him in that way and try to get some eye contact with this, with this physician. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I would approach it that way if I were to see him again. Uh, and, you know, and a lot, oftentimes what I'm finding, what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues uh, is that some of the other physicians or they, they're in practice with have, some, have short some of these skills and they've recognized some of the things that they've done in the past and they've made corrections. So I've had people come to me and ask me, oh, Elisa, oh, Dr. Bell, how can I approach it this way? And I've, I've given them some advice on how to do some things. And uh, it's a learning process. Dr. Carlson, so it's a lifelong learning process. So don't well, be hard. No, I, I think that's right. I, I guess I'm I'm just thinking about um, 
how you learn things. Mm -hmm. And obviously you learn them from going to lectures and reading books and listening to interviews and stuff like that. But I don't think there's anything quite so effective as learning from your patients, right? I mean, when we're in medical school, we read all this stuff in the books or listen to all this lecture stuff. But when you see a patient who's got, I don't know, pneumonia or, you know, whatever the thing is, that sticks in your head. And so, um, as I'm saying, I, I don't really know that we would, especially when you're sick, you necessarily have the presence of mind to be able to, to, to say something back. But you know, it, it sounds like it might be a nice way to, to educate somebody to say, it kind of hurt my feelings, you know, you, you, you just assume that I got sick because I was doing stuff I wasn't supposed to be doing, but that's not okay. how I got sick. You know, I want to, I want to share that. I think that people should, um, do some self-discovery. That's the first step. Acknowledge. Acknowledge that there are differences out in the world. There's different cultures. But do some self-critical awareness of self, your culture. What are your beliefs? What, you know, what are your val- what's your value system? Uh, when you understand yourself better and you become more comfortable with self and know what your shortcomings are, what you need to improve, maybe some of your biases, implicit or explicit biases, perhaps, I'm sure, That'll give you some understanding possibly. Well, maybe this person or this person from this culture is uh, a very different, but has a different belief system than myself. So we had sometimes we, you know, we, we did look at ourselves. So um, the, the three pearls then to take away to be coming more culturally competent, is that the empathy, curiosity, and, and respect, um, um, clues that you gave us before, or are there are some other thoughts that you have? Uh, well, those are some quick ones for communication for uh-huh. during the COVID. Uh-huh. But there are a set of, there, there are seven different um, modalities of how to teach cultural competency. And the one that I use has five or six steps, and that's probably more in debt. So that's why I gave the three pearls, something quick to use uh-huh. during COVID to open up conversations uh, with your patients. Mm-hmm. empathy but i want to i want to impress upon you people about humility doctors who practice humility are the ones who are most effective the research shows what is humility someone who's humble it's uh uh it's a it, it, it's it's a concept it's it's not a you know it, it, it takes it's something learned to be to be humble so that's something i feel that is very important and dear do a cultural competency training to, you know, to discuss humility and practice humility uh, when you engage your patients. That's easier said than done. Yeah, I, it's, it's a, know, it's a process. I, I think doctors are kind of known for being know-it-alls and that's a bit in, incompatible with, uh, with humility. How did you end up writing your book? Um, well, it's, it's interesting. I uh, have always been interested in, in cultures when I was about seven or eight I am, I, my sister and I would imagine that we were dining in France and would start speaking French and trench and my grandmother would catch us. And the next week we would be in Italy. So I've always been curious about different cultures. And I was approached by one of my colleagues here in Chicago who said uh, that they need to, t- they need training at a Pacific university, uh, the medical staff. And I said, why, why was I chosen? And, and well, the group seems to think that you're the most, engaging, the most liberal, and you like people, and uh, you seem to be very uh, uh, outgoing. And I said, really? I said, well, how many times? So I I researched it. I gave one lecture, and then I was invited to give, start giving several different lectures, end up giving a lecture at the state level for some politicians. uh, And it started the conversation about, and having traveled to six different continents, going out of the mainstream when I arrived in that country to find out about, you know, what are the belief systems of this culture? What's the religious? What's, you know, what, what, what is this about? What, what's their value system, their customs? So it's always been an interest to me early on in my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've enjoyed writing the book and, and interviewing the, um, the national director, Tawari Good, and others. Uh, in the book. So it's, it's been a pleasure. It's, it's take, took five years to write, but I hope it would be helpful to, okay. uh, to, to medical professionals. 
So um, that, that, that's kind of a good note to end on. Um, I hope um, in this conversation that um, we've inspired our listeners to seek out more ways to be inclusive and to support diversity for a better workforce and practice. Um, I also wanted to tell people about some of the resources that ACAP has developed. Um, and they are available on our website. So I think we'll, we'll show them at the end, but I'll just kind of go through them verbally. So if you're a training director, you might like to review the cultural competency section of the systems-based practice toolkit. We also have outstanding uh, resources online, the Cultural Diversity Resource Center, a racism resource center, and most recently, a really, really nice Facts for Family on Diversity and Culture in Child Mental Health Care. Um, if you haven't already viewed it, visit the JCAP website to see its statement, A New Vision as an Anti-Racist Journal. And um, I'm not going to read it because it's just impossible to read all of those things, but we'll have it posted. But um, we have a, a, a new We've had some additions to the editorial board who will be vigilant and receptive to uh, culturally competent um, submissions, both in terms of research and in, in terms of very various viewpoints. So um, you and your book fit nicely into the efforts that we're making at ACAP to be more culturally competent. So I thank you very much for being thank with you. us this morning. Thanks for having me. And thank you all for listening. Thank you all very much for tuning in. This is Gay Carlson for ACAP's Screenside Chats. ACAP provides Screenside Chats as a member in public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of ACAP policy. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by ACAP. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their participation in Screenside Chats does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACAP or any of its officials.